All right, so this morning we're going to pick up where we left off a couple weeks ago with this series called Living in Fear. And um, the one we're going to talk about today, the fear that I think people are dealing with today, it's, it's an interesting one. And, and when I was working on this, I thought this will probably come around the time of the election, you know, because I worked on this three weeks ago, a month ago, something like that. And so I was like, it'll probably come around the election. And, you know, I didn't plan it to come like right after the election, but that's the way God works. And it's, you know, that's how, that's why it's up to him. But this fear we're going to talk about today is the fear of being canceled, fear of being canceled. Because we live in canceled culture, right? You know, we, you know, somebody does something wrong, they're immediately cut off. And that's what we have, that's what we deal with. And we have that fear of like, you know, recently, um, a baseball chapel that I volunteer with, um, sent out an email and saying just a reminder of their new social media policy to make sure that you're not posting anything on there. And, and the title, it was addressed to me personally. And I'm like, what did I post? I like panicked. I was like, did I post something I should have? <laughs> I had no idea. So I, I gave my back. Did I do, I figured it was probably a, a, like a mass email and it just personalized each one, but I just wanted to double check. And I said, and I think I emailed uh, Rob Crows who is, you know, one of the leaders of baseball chapel I was like, hey, Rob, did I post something that I shouldn't have? Cause I, I have no idea if I did. And he's like, no, 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 no. This was sent to everyone. So don't worry about it. I was like, okay. Whew. So I, I panicked a little bit, but we have that fear of like, man, did we, did we do something or we say something wrong? We post something wrong on the internet because you know, you post on the internet, it's there forever. And we're afraid that we might be canceled because of it. Back, you're starting to see, um, you're starting to see the effects of this even in the business world because you're starting to see companies now look through social media feeds to see if there's anything alarming. Even when people are being interviewed, they'll look through social media feeds to see if they posted anything. It could be 20 years ago that they posted something. I don't know if there's 20 years ago, it's Titan. Social media was around 20 years ago. But they'll look and see if there's anything that could be suspicious or questionable and they might not get hired or companies that have employees they might fire someone based on what they post. Back in 2013, and I remember when I when I found this because I was curious, like what you know, I just wanted to find a kind of an example of this. And when I saw the story, I do remember this happening. Um, back in 2013, a woman who worked as a PR executive for a New York-based internet empire took a trip to South Africa to visit some family. And maybe some of you remember this. And upon starting her trip, she tweeted on Twitter. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, don't worry. As Twitter, Twitter's a dumpster fire anyway, but um, she said, quote, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding, I'm white. And she tweeted that out. Upon seeing this tweet, the company she worked for immediately fired her for her insensitive and racist remarks. In the internet age, it's becoming increasingly harder to hide anything we do because there's always a footprint somewhere. Even if we may not directly take a condemning picture or video, someone else might. And we live in an age where people are looking to cancel other people. We're look, people are looking to squash voices. And we scrutinize everything as keyboard warriors, hoping to right the injustices in the world with one stroke of the keyboard at a time. We haven't figured out that whatever we type has not changed anyone's life yet. I think it's instilled fear sometimes and even as us as Christians. I see more and more believers acting crazy over rights being infringed upon, political views being pushed to the side, and this has to do you know, with the election, and ignored in our voices being silenced. And so what is happening is when Christians are being pushed in the corner, we find ourselves pushing back. And we fight by staging whether it's a rally or we're screaming for our rights to be respected and we scream so that our voices will be heard and not canceled. And we are doing this out of fear. We are reacting out of fear of being canceled. But my question to pose today is what if being canceled might be a good thing? Now, some of you may be like, you're crazy. I don't know what you're talking about. So what if, but what if we became more and more forgotten so that Jesus could be more and more recognized. 
What if instead of fighting back, we just love more? John the Baptist, we're going to look at him today. And he was a guy who didn't, he was being canceled. He literally was being canceled. And, but that was his whole goal. That was his intention. He welcomed it. He said, yeah, go ahead and cancel me. I don't care. Mm -hmm. He wanted to be canceled because he wanted to make the way for the one who could never be canceled. <clears throat> So that's what we're going to look at today. And hopefully we can combat maybe this fear that maybe we have of being canceled and this fear of, of being squashed and ignored and everything else and seeing somebody who embraced it and how they reacted to it. So the first thing I'll look at is that we need to cancel ourselves. We need to cancel ourselves. In John chapter 1, verses 19 through 23, here's what John the Baptist, the story about John the Baptist recorded here. Said, now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. I forgot to mention that if you want to follow along with sermon notes, it's ser.vi on your phones or tablets. And you can find interactive sermon notes if you just type in Chelmsford Bible Church. Verse 20, he did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. This is such an interesting story because John the Baptist had quite a following. People were coming to him in droves to be baptized in the Jordan River. And he has got audiences all the time to be able to tell them. And to, and to teach them. And I'm sure there was probably that temptation of, maybe I could keep some of these followers. You know, it kind of feeds the ego a little bit. You got people coming to you all the time, wanting to hear from you, wanting to be baptized. But notice how when the religious leaders come to him, they said, who are you? And he doesn't say, well, my name's John. He doesn't even say that. He says, they said, are, are, are you the Messiah? Nope. Are you Elijah? Nope. Then who are you? And he doesn't even say, I'm John the Baptist. I'm not, I, I'm John the Baptist. You know, you, you know, Zachariah, right? You probably know my father. You know him and my mom, Elizabeth. You know them, right? He doesn't say that. He says, I am the voice calling in the desert that Isaiah talked about. He doesn't say his name. He doesn't say where he's from. He just says, hey, I am the voice, the one calling in the wilderness. And I'm here to make the path straight, to get it ready. For Jesus to come. It's a very interesting thing. Because think about the time that these people are living in. These religious leaders took such an interest in John for a few reasons. And this has to do with the time that they're living in. First, they were the ruling body in charge of spiritual and religious matters. It was their job to investigate anything that seemed out of the ordinary or somebody's doing something, or trying to start a movement. It was their duty to go and investigate it. And most of the times they would try to squash it because it ended up not being what they thought it was or what people thought it was. Herod ruled over the Israelites and he was just a puppet king. The Romans gave him his power. He didn't, gain, he didn't get his power from anybody else except the Romans. The religious leaders saw themselves as the final authority on anything that pertained to their religion. They upheld the Jewish law and they enforced it whenever it was necessary. The people were living in a heightened state because of John the Baptist. The murmurings carried an excited tone because God had not spoken to his people for over 400 years. So this guy in the wilderness that's, that's wearing, you know, sackcloth and he's eating locusts and honey. This is weird but he's speaking as though he is a prophet because that's how the prophets of old were. So there's excited murmurings. Secondly, the religious leaders were probably a little concerned about the attention this supposed prophet was receiving. Because the religious leaders had their power and authority only because Rome allowed them to have their power and authority. And if Rome heard about this John the Baptist and he's got this gathering in the wilderness, Rome might come in and say, what are you guys doing? You're supposed to be in charge of this stuff, and this better not turn into an insurrection or rebellion, because you know what's going to happen next. We'll destroy you. 
So the Pharisees wanted to investigate this rabble rouser. They wanted to see for themselves who this John the Baptist was and what exactly he was claiming to be. And this is why they asked him, are you the Messiah? Because in their minds, I think they already had their, their mind made up of who this guy was. He was a nutcase. And they knew that this guy wasn't the Messiah. They just wanted him to say yes. So they'd have some grounds to enact their Jewish law. He claimed to be the Messiah. He is not the Messiah. They weren't going to believe John's message. They were going to cancel John's message. They were going there with the full intent of arresting John and getting rid of him. But again, going back to John's answers, he did not answer to save his own neck. He answered this way, you know, kept saying, no, I'm not, no, I'm not. I am the voice of one calling him. He answered emphatically, meaning he really wanted them to understand what he was saying. So it's not like he's just chilling on a log somewhere in the wilderness going, no, nah, no, nah, you know, I'm the one calling in the wilderness. You know, he was like, no, I am the one calling in the wilderness that Isaiah pro spoke about. You guys should know this. He was passionate. He was emphatically even denying that he was the Messiah. So when they said, are you the Messiah? It wasn't like he's saying, nah. He was like, no. No, get through your heads. No. Are you like, no, I'm not. The Pharisees had come to cancel him, but he did them a favor. And he canceled himself with his answers. Look at Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 24. Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 24 says this. This is Jesus. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Let's reword this a little bit, shall we? Must cancel themselves. Let's do that. Must cancel themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Do you have to put yourself in a first century Jewish person's shoes? That you hear the word cross, you picture shame, disgrace, torture, reserved for the worst of the worst. And now Jesus, who they thought was the Messiah, but the Son of God, was saying, take up that thing daily and follow. Verse 24, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. So Jesus, you know, we think this is odd of John the Baptist canceling himself and, you know, not, not really saying who he is or anything like that, kind of being standoffish, with, you know, whatever. He's just doing what Jesus was going to say later. <coughs> if you want to follow me, then cancel yourself. This is not about you. It's about the kingdom of God. It's about the Messiah. It's about Jesus. If we want to follow Christ, then we must be willing to cancel ourselves. And when we cancel ourselves, we point to Christ. Because Paul even said to the Galatians, for I have been crucified with Christ. And he said, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Paul was willing. And Paul was a guy who was all about himself. Before Jesus, he was all about it. He was like, I was, a fair, I was of the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I knew the law like the back of my hand. I had everything. And then when I met Jesus, all that was rubbish, garbage. And then he said, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. Paul said, forget about me. Forget about me. Remember Jesus. Because that's what it's all about. See, John finally said that he was the voice in the wilderness who was crying out to prepare the way for the true Messiah. He was the one called to be the voice proclaiming the true Messiah was coming. So my question for this, my challenge is, do we just want to be a voice for Jesus or a voice for ourselves? If we're a voice for Jesus, then nothing's going to cancel that. Those people that have come before us, those followers of Christ who have come before us, who follow Jesus with everything they have. Yeah, they weren't perfect. They screwed up along the way, but we still talk about them. 
Because you know what? They weren't a voice for themselves. They were a voice for Jesus. If we want to be a voice for ourselves, our voices will be canceled, and they should be. But if we want to be a voice for Jesus, there's nothing going to stop that. Nothing. So the second thing I want to look at today is we need to cancel ourselves, and this goes right along with this idea, let us decrease. Let us decrease. And this, this plays off of our human pride. This goes against everything in our human pride. Because we are born, born prideful, aren't we? Man, we are full of ourselves. You know, you ever had somebody tell you, I'm the most humble person you've ever met? You know, that's like, that's the exact opposite of humility, you know. But we are so prideful because it's all about us. We want what we want. We want things to go our way. All of these kind of things. We're so prideful. And this whole idea of decreasing goes against that. It goes against our very nature. But look back at John chapter 1, verses 24 through 28. And then going back to John the Baptist. And sometimes it's hard for us to understand because, you know, we're reading these stories and we don't really see how these people lived and, and reacted in between the lines, you know. But I'm sure John the Baptist wrestled with this idea of decreasing, especially, like I said, when people were coming to him, listening to him. But look what John, look what it says. Verse 24. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. You know, like John's just like, look, I baptize with water, but there's a guy coming after me. He's going to do something greater than that. And then look at John chapter 3, verses 25 through 30. Just two chapters over. John chapter 3, verses 25 through 30. This is what it says here. An argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, the one you testified about, look, he is baptizing and everyone is going to him. Here comes the conflict, right? John's disciples are like, John, don't you care? Don't you care? They're going to him. You know that one you testified about? Who's that one he testified about? The son of God. Notice John's reply, verse 27. To this John replied, a person can receive only what is given them from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but am sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. That joy is mine and it is now complete. He must become greater. I must become less. John's disciples are so concerned about their fearless leader. And they're just like, and I, I'm, I'm going to say that I'm going to assume something and I could be wrong because I don't know them. 2,000 years ago they lived, so I don't know. I can't ask them. But I think they're a little bit concerned about their own attention, too. They want to be a part of this next big thing, John the Baptist. But John says, look, here's the deal. I received this from heaven. This was my role. I played my role, and it's done. I'm going to fade into history and hopefully be forgotten so that he can be remembered. John's response is our response, is what our response should be when it comes to Jesus. John reassured his disciples that this was the plan all along. The plan was for John to continue to decrease while Jesus increased. And I think as human beings, as even Americans, it's hard for us to, to wrap our minds around this. It's hard for us to decrease. <laughs> Because we are taught, as from a very early age, to live out the American dream. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So there's nothing wrong with that. <clears throat> but we also have to see it as like it's a very egocentric way of living life. Jesus calls us to a different life. He calls us to a life that is all about being forgotten. So that Jesus can be remembered. 
The Jews were people who wanted to be remembered. Remember us, God. Remember us. We're crying out to you. Remember, remember, remember. It's all about us. We don't want to live with the Romans. We want to be our own people. We want to have our own king. Remember that? Samuel was the, the judge and the prophet. And they went to Samuel and says, ask God for a king because we want our own king. We want to be like everybody else. It's all about us. And then what did God say to Samuel? Samuel was so upset. He was so mad. And, he, and Samuel goes to God and God says, calm down. It's okay. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me as their king. In Acts 20, verse 24, this is what Paul writes. And again, going back to Paul, because Paul is a great study in what it means to be about yourself. And then when you come to Christ, what it means to decrease. Because that's how Paul was. In Acts 20, verse 24, it says this. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. Does that sound familiar? What did John the Baptist say? Here's my task. I'm done. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Man, that's a powerful verse. And Paul said this as he was about to begin his journey into Jerusalem. Everybody's telling Paul, you can't go back there. They will arrest you and they will kill you. And Paul says, I don't consider my life worth anything to me. Now you can read it and say, that's a kind of depressing, little suicidal way of looking at life. That's not what Paul meant. He said, my, my life is expendable compared to Jesus. Because the Ephesian elders were saying goodbye to him and they wanted him to stay because they knew it was coming. And he's like, no, I got to go. I'm going to go to Jerusalem first and then I'm going to Rome. Because Paul's goal was to get before Caesar and tell Caesar who Jesus is. Imagine that boldness. Imagine that goal. To get to the leader of the world. The world. The Roman Empire was the world. And he wanted to get before Caesar and say, Caesar, listen up. You're not king. There's a better one than you. That's a bold move. John the Baptist felt the same way as Paul. John the Baptist has the religious leaders come to him saying, hey, well, who are you? We're going to cancel you. We're going to get rid of you. And John the Baptist was like, bring it. Because that's my goal. He was happy to stand on the sidelines and cheer Jesus on because he knew his own need for Jesus and the rest of the world's need for Jesus. See, John the Baptist was happy being the best man, cheering on the bridegroom who was coming. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what do we do with that? Well, here's the last point is we need to let Jesus increase. Let Jesus increase. And going back to John 3, verses 31 through 36, this is what John the Baptist says. After he says, he must become greater, I must become less. Verse 31, the one who comes from above is above all. The one who is from the earth belongs to the earth and speaks as one from the earth. The one who comes from heaven is above all. He testifies to what he has seen and heard, but no one accepts his testimony. Whoever has accepted it has certified that God is truthful for the one whom God has sent speaks the word of God for God gives the spirit without limit. The father loves the son and has placed everything in his hands. Whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever, whoever rejects the son will not see life for God's wrath remains on them. John telling his disciples, guys, quit worrying about if he's baptized here or not. That was the whole goal in the first place. Remember, I told you, we were just baptizing with water in the Jordan River, and the Jordan <laughs> River wasn't the greatest place to be. If you remember the story in the Old Testament where Naaman comes to see the prophet Elisha, and he comes and he's, he's riddled with leprosy, and Elisha doesn't even go out and see him. He's like, go wash yourself in the Jordan River seven times. And Naaman's like, the Jordan River? Seriously? We got better rivers back where I came from. Jordan River wasn't the end-all be-all. I mean, if you look up pictures today, it's not the clearest place in the world. 
So John is like, I baptized in this Jordan River. He baptizes with the Holy Spirit. I just call people to turn from their sins and get ready. He saves us from our sins. John explained why Jesus was better. John says, I came from this earth. Jesus did not come from this earth. He came from above. How much do we believe that Jesus is better? Even better than us. Those seem like easy questions to answer, but do we live as though Jesus is better? I don't know about you, but when things like go bad or, you know, even if it's just at the house or, you know, something like that, I start freaking out. I'm a freak show, you know, <laughs> just spiral. You know, it's just nuts. When things go bad in the world, you know, we tend to sometimes freak out. But how many, but we, we, sometimes we freak out when we think our, our rights are going to be taken from us. But think about this. How many rights did the early apostles have? Everywhere they went, people were telling them, you can't talk in the name of Jesus. You can't preach the name of Jesus. You can't share the name of Jesus. One of, one of my favorite stories is when Peter and John are in prison. And the angel comes and releases them. And the angel doesn't tell him, all right, go back to the other side, we'll get some rest and we'll regroup. The angel says, go back to where you came from. Go back to where they arrested you and start preaching the gospel again. <laughs> How many rights did John the Baptist have? John the Baptist rebuked King Herod for marrying his brother's wife without his brother even being dead. His new wife didn't like this and had her daughter ask for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. John the Baptist was in prison at the time because people wanted to cancel him and they eventually succeeded. The point is, the early disciples of Jesus, even John the Baptist, didn't let rights being infringed upon stop them from making sure Jesus increased. They kept sharing the gospel. They kept living the gospel. Even later on, when the early church was persecuted by Rome, the early Christians continued to make Jesus big by how they handled being canceled. Even some of the Roman historians would talk about the Christians, talk about these followers of the way, and they were amazed at how they lived. Imagine what the church in America and even around the world would look like today. If we were more concerned with making Jesus big than giving into the fear of being canceled. Because here's the thing. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not even be able to stand against it. The gospel will never be canceled. Because remember what Peter said. When Jesus was like, who do people say that I am? And then, you know, they get, he got some answers here and there. And Peter said, well, you're the Christ. After Jesus got all these answers, he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not given, you didn't come up with this. It was given to you by my father in heaven. And he said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And some have looked at that and said, well, that, you know, Jesus is telling Peter he's going to build the church upon him. Well, thank goodness that's not what it means. Because Peter still screwed up even after Jesus rose again as was leader of the church. What Jesus was saying was that, yeah, Peter is the Petros, the rock. But the greater rock is what Peter said out of his mouth. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. As long as that is the church's message, the church will never be canceled. Jesus is the one who deliver us, delivers us from the wrath of God. Jesus is the one who pours out the love and grace of God upon us. And Jesus is the one who saves us. Let us decrease so that he may increase. And again, I know that's hard because, man, we're prideful people. It is all about us. That's why we need to be changed. That's why we need Jesus to save us. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit to come in and change us and start working in our lives. Start eliminating the junk. So in closing, let's cancel ourselves. 
let us cancel ourselves and let us decrease. And the whole purpose of those two ideas, to cancel ourselves and to decrease, is so that Jesus can increase. Amen? Amen. Amen.